Hello and welcome to the program. I'm your host, Neil Howard, here on Health Professional Radio. Thank you for once again making us part of your day. Going to have a conversation with returning guest, Dr. N. Lawrence Edwards. He's chairman of the Gout Education Society, and he's joining us uh, on the program, returning to talk about some brand new research that's revealed some pretty surprising results. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Edwards. How have you been? Good. And yourself, Neil? Doing well. Glad that you could uh, join us again and uh, talk about uh, some new research. For our listeners who may not be familiar with you, give us a bit of background about yourself. Uh, Obviously, you know, the chairman of the Gout Education Society, you're uh, very knowledgeable about gout. Yes, I've been involved in gout research and care of gout patients for the past 40 years. Um, The Gout Education Society is a nonprofit organization. Uh, with a website that uh, that tries to educate both patients as well as the general population about this widely misunderstood disease. Oh, what are some of the misconceptions about gout? I mean, when I was a, a kid, you know, just a couple years ago, I I uh, thought that gout was uh, something that uh, royalty got back in, uh, you know, back in the in history, or it was something that people got because of, of rich <laughs> living. What exactly is gout? Well, that's part of the mythology that continues to this day. Uh, that uh, historically it was a disease of the wealthy uh, because um, uh, they were big consumers of wine, and and the rest of the population was starving. I guess, mm-hmm. um, but um, it is a not a disease of of huge excess or overindulgence, which is the implication of the the Royalty Association. Um, that's part of the mythology and part of the stigma that's associated with um, somebody having gout that, uh, again, we uh, we look on this disease as a, in the population as being something that is self-inflicted, that if this patient just hadn't uh, been such a big consumer of various substances that are known to trigger gout, such as beer or red meat or or shellfish, um, that they wouldn't have the problem. But in truth, gout is a genetic disease, and most all the risk that comes with developing gout uh, is in your genes and not on the plate in front of you. Uh, There are certainly foods that can trigger flares, and I mentioned some of those, uh, beer and and red meat and shellfish are the rather classic ones. But to actually develop the disease is um, something that you're predisposed to by uh, your genetic inheritance. I understand that there are fewer than one in three of people that are dealing with gout are getting the treatment that they need to avoid flares, future flares, uh, complications, dealing with some of the stigma that, that you just talked about. Uh, what about this this un, obviously unmet need when it comes to gout? Yeah, and that's an interesting part of this very common and very chronic disease is that we know a lot about it. We've actually had good therapies for gout Um for the past 50 years, um, there are some newer medications on the market that fill in little holes where people that weren't tolerant to the older medications uh, could now be treated better. But a lot of this has to do with general misunderstanding of the disease by the patients who have it, by the physicians that are treating them, mm-hmm. and again, by the general public. So part of the stigma of of having gout is that patients are embarrassed. They know they have gout because their father or their uncle had gout and they just don't go seek the medical care that they should. Well, let's talk about some of this uh, new research that, um, you know, you say has revealed some surprising results. Uh, Of course, you've been involved in research and development of different gout and gout treatments and whatnot throughout your career, but let's talk about some of this new research. Is it hopeful for gout patients? Absolutely. Um, That's, uh, internationally, uh, treatment guidelines have been coming out over the past 10 years. Uh, the American College of Rheumatology um, has an excellent set of uh, newly revised guidelines that teach physicians exactly how we should be managing this disease. The tr- same is true with Europeans and uh, in Asian countries uh, all have their own set and very closely linked to, to what the American College of Rheumatology so I think the more this information gets disseminated to physicians, the more likely patients are to 
be told about this disease and dispel some of the myths that uh, continue to make it so poorly treated. What, in your opinion, has been the the barrier to um, getting the word out about the truth, getting the truth out about gout uh, up until up until now? Gout is an interesting disease in that it comes um, with a number of medical conditions associated with it. Uh, those include uh, obesity, uh, chronic kidney disease, hypertension, heart disease, elevated cholesterol. All of these components are, make up the what's called the metabolic syndrome, uh, and gout is certainly part of that. Out of all of those conditions, uh, primary care physicians uh, tend to focus on the hypertension and the heart disease and the kidney disease and um, just overlook the significant problems that having gout places on the patient as far as their ability to participate in normal activities, uh, their time away from work, and just the quality of life issues that, uh, that having a chronic arthritic condition like gout can, can cause. If I'm understanding uh, correctly, it's not a matter of ignoring gout as being less significant than its associated uh, uh, conditions, but it's um, uh, maybe missing it. And um, despite patient complaints of certain types of pain, uh, maybe physicians are associating that pain with that condition as opposed to gout is because I'm sure it's not just saying, okay, you've got uh, you're obese. That's more important than dealing with gout or you have kidney disease. That's more important than dealing with the associated gout. Is that what I'm understanding? Well, I wish that was the case. Uh, I think that that is the position of a number of, of physicians taking care of it, that, um, that they're treating these other conditions and, and don't have time. And that, that idea gets passed on to patients so that they, they don't recognize that there are good medications, good approaches to, to eliminating this condition for them. One of the other issues is that early on in the disease, the disease is intermittent. There's big flares that are these terribly painful processes that can last for weeks at a time and hobble the patient up pretty good. Um, but then between the attacks, uh, the symptoms have resolved completely and the patient is feeling good. Now, over time, pain will become more and more chronic and eventually disabling and destructive. But in those early stages, patients get the idea that while they're having a flare, they have gout. When they're not having a flare, they don't have gout. And so they would go off medications. Uh, they don't recognize that the underlying problem with gout is that this elevated uric acid in their blood is going to be there uh, the whole time until you treat it effectively. And so Patients going off medications when they're not having symptoms is another big aspect of, of why this disease is so poorly treated. So basically, the perception of gout needs to be changed drastically on both uh, the patient side and the physician side as you know, the patient is becomes less embarrassed about something that is as serious as it's possibly related illness. And on the other side, the physician needs to basically have time to deal with it because it is as serious, if not more so than some of its related uh, conditions. Would you agree? I think you've summed it up excellently, Neil. <laughs> That's exactly the two pronged problem of, of, um, both on the physician side and on the patient side, getting better information. You know, early in our conversation, you mentioned a website that our listeners could uh, go to and get more information about the uh, Gout Education Society and maybe some uh, treatments and uh, other information about gout as well. Yes, um, Gout Education Society has had a website for the past 12 years. Um, the address is um, www.goudeducation, all one word, dot org. Um, in addition to patient education, uh, we also have a physician education side. Mm -hmm. And also on that website, we list uh, across the country um, physicians that have told us that they stick to the recommended guidelines, and we list these physicians. So if your own doctor isn't uh, taking your gout disease seriously, 
there are uh, listings uh, by localities across the country of physicians who recognize this as the important disease that it is and treat it appropriately. Always a pleasure, Dr. Edwards. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, returning here on Health Professional Radio. Hope to speak with you again. Good to be with you, Neil. Thank you. You've been listening to Health Professional Radio. I'm your host, Neil Howard. Transcripts and audio of this program are available at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. You can also subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, listen in and download at SoundCloud, and be sure and visit our affiliates page at hpr.fm and healthprofessionalradio.com.au. Thank you for listening to Health Professional Radio. We're very proud to be an independent broadcaster providing our content free of charge to you, the listener. One of the ways that we're able to remain free and independent is by having people like you become patrons. You can support Health Professional Radio simply by visiting hpr.fm and clicking the button that says Become a Patron. Your patronage of even just $1 a month lets us know that you're there, which in turn makes us more valuable to advertisers. And, of course, if you're able to afford more, then we would certainly appreciate the support. My name is Toby Longhurst from Health Professional Radio. Please visit hpr.fm, click the Become a Patron button and support us if you can.